and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. As always, I'm Abby. This is Stories Lived, Stories Told, and here's what I know. We have choices about the way that we communicate. A lot of us grow up and kind of just internalize or learn about communication from the patterns that are modeled to us, which may or may not be healthy and effective patterns of communication. We take those in and we kind of understand communication to be what we grew up with. And unless you study communication, then you might never realize that you have other options about how to communicate and also that those choices can be really tangible, that we could talk about them in a really real way and kind of identify the choices that we have around how we communicate. Because we believe that it's our communication that creates our social worlds, that everything around us is created through some form of communication, that makes it really important for us to think about our choices. Today we are finishing up our conversation with Karen and Sonia Foss. This is part three of our conversation, and so if you haven't listened to the first two parts yet, I will definitely point you back to episodes one and two to listen to those first so you can have context for our conversation today and get to know Karen and Sonia a little better before jumping into this last part of our conversation. In today's conversation, Karen and Sonia offer some great strategies that have to do with our choices that we have around communication and how we can change our reality by changing how we perceive our reality. They offer a couple great strategies in here that you might find helpful in your own life. And so the question I'd have you keep in mind as you listen today are which one of these strategies resonate with you? Which one feels doable? Which one feels helpful to you? Maybe multiple feel helpful. Maybe you want to try out multiple. But regardless of whichever strategy sticks out to you today, I think this is a great episode because everything we talk about is really actionable, I guess is how I would say it, in that you can listen to this conversation, turn it off, and then go out into your life and hopefully take some of the things that we talk about today with you. Okay, so with that all in mind, let's jump right in. I think where I'm coming from with this question is that you giving your whole background, it's very clear how your life experiences affected the work you've ended up doing. And so I'm curious about the reverse of that, you know, at this point in your careers, how has the work that you've done shown back up in your personal life outside of the work that you do in terms of those concepts, the language, the tools, and the skills that you've learned over the years? The core of this, as you know, for us is interpretation. So the awareness that we have choices, that we can always make changes, continues to operate in our own lives. I think if, if we had to say what, how we live our lives, it's, is this the world in which I want to be living? So if it's not the world in which I want to be living, what are you going to do about it? And I think we have certain strategies that we use that come out of social construction, that come out of feminism, that we are not, or unconsciously using sometimes and maybe more consciously other times, so that we do create the worlds that we want. So I think we have taken this to heart. Maybe it was part of how we kind of always operated in the world, but our work has given us the language for it. And now we can more deliberately apply it. So, so let's just give a few examples of the kinds of strategies we use for interpreting and interpreting differently. Uh, and I think the first one, and this will be uh, familiar to those who are um, who know about CMM, um, it's reframing. And as we've said, we're always selecting ways to interpret, and reframing simply involves selecting new frames to put around something. So to transform a situation or a condition into something that's benign and harmless. So we're essentially viewing a situation from a different vantage point. So if we call something a problem, uh, for example, uh, if we change and cause it, I call it an opportunity, that makes it less of a problem. 
gives us ways to generate resources and options that we didn't have before. And we really like uh, the way that Dalai Lama talks about reframing, or he gives a great example of it. You know, he was exiled from his own country, Tibet. And he says, in my case, I lost my country. From that viewpoint, it's very tragic. But if I look at the same event from another angle, I realize that as a refugee, I have another perspective. As a refugee, there's no need for formalities, ceremony, protocol. If everything were status quo, if things were okay, then on a lot of occasions, you merely go through the motions, you pretend. But when you're passing through desperate situations, there's no time to pretend. So from that angle, this tragic experience has been very useful to me. Uh, He also talks about how as a refugee, he's met a lot of people he wouldn't have met otherwise. And he says, again, in that sense, it's been very, very useful. So that was one strategy. Another one we like to use is appreciation. So this is deliberately choosing to attend to positive aspects of something or productive aspects of something. Um, And with appreciation, compared to sort of thanking somebody afterwards, you proactively, before the fact, appreciate someone or something in order to shift the energy or to set up the energy that you want to have happen. And because every person or condition has positive aspects, you can always find something to appreciate. Again, you know, we've got an innumerable amount of symbols, so start applying a different set here. Um, This can be as simple as making a list of someone's positive qualities, like the boss you don't like, and going over it every day, putting it in your refrigerator or whatever. Um, We really like the example that Alice Walker gave. And I actually heard her speak a few days after 9-11, and this is the example she gave because everyone was wanting to go off to war and blah, 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 blah. And she told this example of a tribe in South Africa where when a person asks or acts irresponsibly or inappropriately, there's a big tribal ceremony where the person is placed in the center of the village and every person in the tribe comes and says every positive thing they can think about that person, every good thing they've ever done. And this process often lasts for several days. And at the end, the tribal circle is broken. There's a big celebration. The person is symbolically and literally welcomed back into the tribe. So very different. Wow. Yeah. To conflict um, situations. So, Sonia, do you want to do another (laughs) one? Another one that we like is um, called enactment. And this is where you act in alignment with the interpretation that you have chosen. So displaying in my own life, the changes I desire, trying to embody the world as I would like it to be. And we keep quoting Sonia Johnson here. We like her stuff a lot. And she summarizes this as live today as you want the world to be. And of course, we all know Gandhi's, we must become the change uh, we want to see. Um, And this strategy is actually based on something from quantum physics Mm -hmm. uh, that says, Time is not linear the way we usually think of it. We think of time as past, present, future, and it's passing kind of like a river. Well, quantum physics says no, past, present, and future are all mixed together. Like it's like a big ocean, and we're the fish swimming in this ocean with all this time mixed together. So what this means is that the means are the ends. So whatever we are doing in this present moment is the end or the future that we are producing. So it's both our experience of now and the outcome. So the world we want is either right now or it's never. Uh, We are creating the world in which we live now and in which we will live in the future. Uh, So this means we want to act out or embody the interpretation we've chosen of something, even and especially when the external conditions don't support that interpretation. So we want to behave as if the situation has changed, even if it hasn't yet. So if we want a world, for example, where women are not afraid, we have to be unafraid right now. So we stop going to take back the night, Marcus, because take back the night assumes that you have to take back the night because you're afraid of something. Hmm. I think that is a really interesting place that I find myself in and I think, you know, fourth wave feminists or whatever you would want to call this time right now is 
yeah, how do you live in between that envisioning the better social world and saying what you want, embodying that, realizing that, and also acknowledging where you are right now and what is true, because it is true that scary bad things happen to women at night. So how can you find that balance of saying what I want for the future is already so because I'm making it so. And I also acknowledge ways that I need to keep myself safe. That's probably a whole other podcast on its own, but that's just what came up in my mind where you thinking about and, you know, in your book, presenting all the different waves. And um, I feel like it's really helpful for me to be able to see the um, constancy that's through all of them, but also the really, really unique challenges that each one faced. really good example of this enactment strategy uh, comes from the civil rights movement of the 60s. And this was obviously when Blacks were challenging the laws, um, especially in the South, that discriminated against them. And this group called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, um, started to do these sit-ins at lunch counters in Woolworths and other department stores. And they weren't supposed to, you know, they weren't allowed to sit and eat at those lunch counters. And so they would just, these students would just take a seat Uh, They would be reading, studying, talking quietly among themselves. They were very polite, but they just did not move when they were asked to move. So they were living as if segregation did not exist. Mm, Yes. They were claiming the respect and the dignity that segregation was denying them. So it was really, they were creating freedom by their own actions, freedom as an inside job. Yeah, that's a great example. So they were acting as if the freedom they desired for the world had already been manifest. Mm. They were reinforcing their interpretation of conditions as no longer oppressive for them. Now, back to your earlier point, a lot of people say, well, when you engage in the strategy of enactment, you are denying reality. You're not being honest about the way things are in the world when you focus on your chosen interpretation and not these conditions in the world. But we're always denying some potential realities in the Hmm. act. Any statement about the world is necessarily incomplete. So when we think and speak about strawberries, we're not speaking and talking about cherries. Uh, When we speak and talk about war, we're not talking and speaking and thinking about peace. Hmm. And there's nothing inherently superior from choosing from all the options available, the subjects and the aspects of subjects that are negative and problematic. Uh, So another strategy that we use is to focus on desired outcomes. And this follows naturally, I think, from enactment in the sense that when you resist or oppose something that you don't want, you're really creating more of it because communication is generative. Sonia Johnson, our favorite, says that we resist, persist. And she gave this wonderful example that really brought it home to us. She said, imagine patriarchy as a fort on a hill. And for centuries, women have been running at the at this fort and trying to break down the doors and, you know, balls over the walls and whatever, cross the moats. And what are the men doing inside? They're strengthening things. They're reinforcing things. They're making it even more concrete and more tough. So... We're just getting what you don't want while you keep resisting and banging up against something and struggling to get something out of your life or struggling to get something to change. You're giving that thing or person power. Will you say that quote one more time from her? Uh, What we resist persists. What we resist persists. Yeah, yeah, that's good. (laughs) So rather than giving that power, reinforcing something as reality that we don't want, uh, focus on what you do want, pivot, turn to something um, positive. A good example, I think, um, that helps people understand this is if you go through a buffet line at a cafeteria, you pick out the food you like to eat, but you don't go running to the manager and telling them they have to remove the mushrooms because you don't like mushrooms. We let them stay on the buffet table. We just don't choose them. Mm-hmm. So I think the same holds true with communication. Why don't we communicate and choose what we want rather than 
demanding that what we don't want be somehow removed from the equation. Um, and they've actually found that lots of programs that are designed to change people's behavior, like, did you ever hear of Scared Straight where they took kids into prisons? Mm -hmm. That yeah. actually increased criminal activity among these kids. Or the D.A.R.E. drug program increased drug use. Or Prohibition, more alcohol was drunk during Prohibition because they all the laws that dictated where you could have alcohol went away. So there were thousands more speakeasies scattered all over the place. Um, instead of you know two saloons or something, there were ten speakeasies. So when you're focusing on what you don't want, you know, that's what you get. I think the modern example of that is with abortion legislation. Of if you make abortions illegal, that's not saying people aren't going to get abortions; they're just going to do them. That's right. In an unsafe way. Yes. Well, and actually, speaking about abortion, Sonny Johnson. When Roe versus Wade first passed, she said, oh, no, wrong way to do it, because then mm -hmm. we have to constantly keep fighting to keep that in place. Right. She said what we needed to do was get one woman on every block who knew how to do an abortion. Mm -hmm. uh, another strategy uh, we call joyful allowing. And just as we want to be allowed to create our own life experiences, we have to let others do the same. We have to allow them to be as they choose in the world. And this doesn't mean just tolerating. We hear a lot about teach tolerance, but at the root of tolerating is, well, I'll put up with you, but I really wish you would change. Mm. And so that's not what we have in mind. We mean joyful appreciation of the differences between us and someone else. A stance of how wonderful it is that another person is different from us and the joyful allowing of that person to be different. So the great diversity of perspectives in the world gives us all sorts of good things. We get clarity on what we want and what we don't want when we see it being enacted by different people. We are also grateful for different perspectives because they give us new information about the world. So information that helps us understand something or another person better. And plus, it'd be really boring if everyone thought exactly the same way and did exactly the same things. I mean, how fun would that be? <laughs> Not okay. <laughs> yes. So the last one we'll talk about quickly is resourcement, which is a, a term coined by Sally Miller Gerhardt. And this is when you're interacting with someone and they've introduced a frame that you don't want to communicate in. How can you get out of that mode? Mm -hmm. So her definition of resourcement is really drawing energy from a different source. So you go someplace mm -hmm. different from the original framing. Um, and there are two ways you can do this. You can just disengage. You cannot respond at all um, can, because you recognize that if you continue in that frame, the relationship is going to suffer. Future interactions may be jeopardized because you're going to get in some big screaming match or something. That's not going to do anyone any good. Um, so you can walk away. You can delete an email. You know, you don't need to respond. But the second one is, is more interesting because here you have to creatively come up with a response that changes the frame as you're doing it. So you bring in another source. It's as if you're responding to something different than that what they are thinking you're going to respond to. Um, a good example of this comes from the movie The Long Walk Home, where the women are, are black and white women are together um, walking during the bus boycott. And there's civil rights movement during the civil rights movement. And they're, they're surrounded by this group of angry men at one point. And normally women would, I don't know, try to stop them or talk to them or whatever. But these women just join hands and start singing a gospel song. So what, what can you do with that? You know, it just changes the interaction. Um, another one we like is the boring Baroque response, which was uh, created by Suzette Hayden Algen. And this is if you're if you're an old waiter in a restaurant and you get constantly harassed by some guy who wants you to go out with him. And finally, you I mean, you most women will keep saying no, 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 no. Then you're responding in the same frame. But you can also just ignore the content of the message and start telling this long story. This is the boring Baroque. 
oh, well, the reason I won't go out with you is because I grew up in North Dakota. And I remember sitting on my swing when I was eight years old, watching the wheat waving in the breeze. You just babble, 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 babble. <laughs> and pretty soon the guy just got the water stop. What's he going to do? Um, but what's interesting is as a, as a way to handle sexual harassment, you don't need to hire a lawyer. You don't need to go to HR. You don't have to have a bunch of money. You just have to tell a story that you can make up on the spot. So it's also a really nice way for women who might we might think of as not having the resources to handle sexual harassment. Well, they absolutely do have the resources. So um, anyway, it's refusing to participate in the frame and coming up with a much more creative one. So, so those are the major strategies I think that we like to apply. Yeah, those are great. That what we that we hope other women might start using some of these as well. Mm -hmm. Written about a lot of them in um, many of our books. I think the way you spoke about them and the way you've written about them does make them really accessible, which I think is just yeah so important and is you know my goal. And so I appreciate the contribution of that. Using those examples makes it um, more tangible. I think as something that we actually could adopt into our own everyday lives because I think that when I say oh, it's our communication that creates our social worlds. Even I think some people are like, communication? What do you mean by that? That's so abstract. Or they they go to persuasion. They're, is that what you're talking about? No, not really. What's a social world? <laughs> yeah, what's, what's a social world? Uh, yes. And so it's like, how do I, yeah, make that a tangible thing? Because it is, you know, not some abstract force in the wind floating by, but it's, you know, yeah, real tangible things that we have and people have studied. So one thing we can't end the podcast without talking about is I'm just so curious about what it's been like for you to work. It seems your whole life very closely together as sisters and scholars and co-authors together. Yes, I think it's probably not as strange as it might seem just because we grew up doing everything together. Mm. We took the same kind of lessons. We did everything together. It was easier for our parents, I think. Um, so it was very natural for us to write together. Now, we do try to keep things equal when we're writing. Um, when you're a twin, you really grow up with a model of equality, and you want always things to be equal. So we laugh even now when we're pouring like wine into glasses for people. We have to make sure they're exactly <laughs> even. So, so when <laughs> When we write and everybody laughs. Everybody who knows us laughs when they see us do this. Um, but I think because of that, when we write, we do try to divide up tasks equally. You know, we assign one chapter to one person and one to another. Uh, and interestingly, the division of labor usually sorts itself out pretty easily. One person just feels like doing one thing and the other person feels like doing something else. And rarely do we right. have to you know, have a discussion about, well, don't you want to do this? And the same thing happens. We both sew and we sometimes will be working on the same thing together. And so often one person will just feel like doing buttonholes that day. And the other person has no interest in doing <laughs> buttonholes and they're fine with putting cuffs on sleeves or something. Yeah. Um, so it just strikes it us. It works out. Yeah. yeah. It just strikes us like, oh, I feel like doing that. And Karen <laughs> will say, oh yes, I feel like doing this other thing. And I absolutely do not feel like right. doing that. <laughs> right. so. Right. Yeah. Um, I think, though, that because uh, we're sisters and we grew up together, that means we often think alike. And that can be a bit of a limitation because mm -hmm. when you when often when you write with a co-author, you get a real different perspective. And that's really good and adds a lot of new yeah. ideas. We don't get that as much um, as a result. Uh, but because we think so much alike, I think it makes the task go more quickly and more easily. Uh, now we can get into some knockdown drag out fights. <laughs> so you would never do with another co-op. No. <laughs> um, and we had some of those growing up too, um, but they don't last long. And we know it's not going to damage our relationship and we can usually resolve them pretty easily. Um, and, and ultimately I think, our collaboration fits into our feminism too, because mm. collaboration is a very feminist act and the feminist values of 
cooperation and respect for other people's perspectives and caring are very much inherent in collaborative research. Yeah, if everyone could just be Karen and Sonia Foss interacting <laughs> together, the world would be much better. Equality, <laughs> collaboration. It seems like you got it figured out. <laughs> oh. All right. So to end on, Karen and Sonia, what does a better social world look like to you? A better social world, I think, is where we understand we have interpretive options, that we have choice, um, that we have an infinite number of ways to perceive, to label things, to act into the world. Um, and also, I think, because we create our own life experiences, we can create a better social world by choosing what the, those experiences are, what those worlds mm -hmm. are like. And if we don't like our current life experiences, then we can change them. Uh, I think another piece of it would be something we've already talked about quite a bit, but let people and things be. Instead of thinking anyone who's not like you is stupid or ignorant and needs to change, we realize that all the perspectives are necessary for the diversity of the world. And so in this better social world, we delight in how uh, different other people's choices are from us. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I think, you know, everything we've been talking about this whole conversation has been one big answer to the question of what's a better social world. Uh, this might be kind of fun. Um, we sometimes use the metaphor of uh, a box. Imagine you're sitting in a chair and there's a big box next to you and you're the creator. So this is the world you're creating, this world in this box. And you get to reach out anywhere in the universe and plop and something down and put it in your box. So maybe it's a beautiful house or a mountain cabin or um, a job where you're making lots of money doing really what you enjoy or, um, you know, whatever. And so you can play this as a mental game where you can actually get pictures of these things and drop them into the box. And what I think is most interesting about this is if some thought comes in like, well, I don't think I'm really qualified for that kind of job or, oh, that city is really expensive to live and I don't think I could do that. You realize that that's a choice to be thinking that too. And you can say, oh, that's an odd thing. I don't want that in my box. Out it goes. So I can just go back to my vision of living in the city, no matter how expensive it might be. So you put the focus back on what you want instead of what you don't want. And you're making choices. So essentially the question is, what's it going to be? And you get to choose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's what we always got to be asking ourselves. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that transitions nicely into after, you know, my conversations, I like to think in terms of that CMM language of what's the next turn. If, you know, it's one big conversation, life, relationships, mm -hmm. all your work, the podcast, what is the next turn? Where do we go from here? And so I think it's, you know, you shared all of those strategies that you like to use in your own life from your work. I think for the people listening to this, it's, you know, seeing if any of those can work in their own life. Maybe it's checking out your book, which was really good. I can link to where they can find it and maybe all of your other work too, even to just build out that world. Do you have any other thoughts for what a good next turn is, where to go from this conversation? I think we've said what we have to say. Yeah. Perfect. It was wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing all that. Yeah. Okay, that is all for the final part of our conversation with Karen and Sonia Foss. A huge thank you to them for agreeing to be guests and for sharing their knowledge and also their passion and excitement for everything that we talked about, this intersection of communication and feminism for sharing that so readily and freely with all of us. I think they are a great example of what we talked about in part two of our conversation as far as what an ethical form of persuasion looks like, which might be just being excited about the things that excite you and not being ashamed of that and leaning into it and letting that be what excites others, you know, in a kind of contagious way. Anyway, I think we have been left with a lot to think about from these three conversations. And so as always, I hope you'll keep 
ruminating on what you've heard and things that stick out to you, things that you had questions about, things that you resonated with, things that you didn't understand. There's more conversation to be had off of this conversation, as we know. As always, I get to do this podcast with support from the CMM Institute for Personal and Social Evolution. I'm really excited about the mission that the CMM Institute has and all the various initiatives, including this podcast that we get to do that are perfect examples of acting in a way that is aligned with the goal of creating better social worlds and just in everything we do, asking ourselves, how can we create better social worlds through our communication right now? So a huge thank you to the CMM Institute and everyone there that has supported me. And a special thank you to Rick Spann, who's also a member of the CMM Institute and was kind enough to provide the music for this podcast so generously so that we might continue to find layers of meaning in all kinds of forms, including our music. And last but not least, I appreciate you if you can take the time to follow the show wherever you listen, leave a rating, leave a review, share an episode that's been meaningful to you with someone who you'd like to invite into the conversation. And then, of course, you can connect with me. Like I said, maybe you have lingering questions or maybe something we talked about has gotten you really excited. I love to hear either or all of the things that these episodes make you think. So please connect with me. Uh, you can do that in a couple different ways. One is through email, storieslive.storiestold at gmail.com. You can also contact me through the website, which is storieslivedstoriestold.com. You can find me on Instagram at Stories Live Stories Told Pod and comment on YouTube, which is just Stories Lived Stories Told. So I hope you'll reach out to me. And as always, I appreciate keeping this conversation going with you. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being curious. And thank you for being a part of this story today. As always, I'm Abby, and this has been Stories Live Stories Told. 